Hey guys, welcome to episode two of Discord Dilemmas. Today we're gonna to be taking a look at how to spawn an object and attach it to a socket and then adjust its position so that it lines up nicely in the hand or the head depending on the type of item. This is only for items that don't need to conform and warp with the skeletal mesh, so this obviously won't work with armor or clothing. Unless you plan on freezing your players in a nay pose as soon as they put something on. Some devs may be against that, but forget the naysayers. These are your players playing by your rules and it's your game. Going up in flames. So Mr. Bleep was spawning a weapon and attaching it to a mesh socket and that was working great but when he was trying to adjust the location and rotation, it was working for the server but it wasn't doing anything for the clients. He was able to fix it by doing a multicast and sending the rotation and location information from the server to the clients and that is in fact one way to fix it. However, he felt like something was wrong and he was absolutely right in thinking so. So let's talk about why that's not the ideal way to do it. The first reason is that multicast can only happen on the players if they are relevant to the actor that called that multicast multicast. So any players that show up later that miss that initial call will not see the adjusted position. This can be fixed by a rep notify, but that leads me into point number two. Multicast or rep notifies both add an extra call from the server to the client and they depend on data being transferred or replicated, something that is not necessary because there is a better way. Let's take a look at a quick example that I've set up for you, but before we start, just a quick tip, try to make sure your equipable items origin point is roughly where you'd want the grip to be. This makes things easier and will potentially help you avoid adjusting some of the items or at least it'll make the adjustments way easier to manage with smaller values. However, it is pretty entertaining watching somebody try to take something from outer space and put it in the player's hand because their origin is so bad. So you do you boo, you do you. Your game going up in flames. In this example, we've got an equipment slots enum that has the various sockets that I'll be attaching items to. I name them exactly the way that I have them on the skeleton, the head, the right hand, and the left hand. The enum is also in our inventory item structure and I named it socket because that's what these slots will be corresponding with. Yours may not be the case, but I'm just doing this for simplicity's sake, so don't take this setup as the gospel truth. In our struct, we also have a class variable that's of type BP underscore parent, and it's important that I specify the class here instead of leaving it generic, otherwise when we try to spawn these classes, we won't have the proper variables exposed, and I'll show you what I mean when we get to that part. I also have a variation variable here that's just an integer. This is going to be used to spawn a different type of handheld item using the exact same class. This is important because you don't have to have a different class for 50 different weapons that do the exact same thing like swing with the only difference being the mesh and a few other pieces of data like how much damage they do or what the weapon looks like or whatever. If the majority of the functionality is the same, you might as well use the same class and only change the pieces that you need. So we've got three actors here. The big red one is the parent and the other two are the children that inherit from that parent. In the parent, our root component is a scene and our child component is a static mesh. This is important because if you make your static mesh the root, you won't be able to do what we're about to do and it'll be very frustrating down the road. So make sure your component that you want to manipulate is not the root component of the actor because once you make it the root, you cannot adjust its location and rotation relative to the actor. Tip number two, this is just a personal preference thing, but I like to set my parent classes to generic shapes and apply painfully vibrant red material against them. I do this in case they ever end up in the wrong folder or if they're not named properly, the thumbnail sticks out like a sore thumb and I'm careful to not edit this actor willy-nilly, knowing that if I do, there may be some children that will break if I do so. That's just a personal organization thing, but I think it may save some of you from making some boo-boos, so y'all do whatever you want with that, but don't come crying to me when you delete your parent actor thinking it was a child, okay? That's your game in flames. Anyway, in this parent actor, I've created five variables, location and rotation offsets, and variation socket and pawn that are all set to instance editable and exposed on spawn. On event begin play, this is going to be executed on both the client and the server. So on both, we want to set the mesh and add the offsets to the mesh. Then we filter out the clients and we make sure that only the server is the one doing the attachment of the actor to the socket. This attach node already handles the replication to the clients. That's why calling it on the server only still allows the client to see that attachment. You might ask why there's two conversions here, but we need to convert this from an enumerator to a string and then we can convert it to a name. Otherwise, you won't get a friendly name for the enumerator. Feel free to print string if you really don't believe me. So the way this is working is that we're snapping the actor to the socket's location and rotation and then we're changing the relative position of the component from the center of the actor which is also the same thing as the center of the socket. I'll show you guys a little trick at the end of the video that might help you figure out how to adjust the relative position and rotation of the component in a way that makes sense so that you don't have to guess what values you have to change to move it in a certain direction. So we've got this get mesh pure function that I've created. We get into pure functions in a different episode so don't worry if you don't know what they are yet. If we look inside you'll see that nothing is happening in here. 
here. It's simply returning an empty mesh reference. You can set the function to pure by clicking this checkbox right here. There's nothing in here because we want the function to behave differently depending on which child it's being called on. So let's go look at the child classes, the BP helmet and the BP weapon. BP helmet inherits from BP parent like we said and all we're doing here is overriding the parent mesh with a helmet. Kinda. In the event graph, nothing is happening, and over here in our functions tab, you'll notice that we have this get mesh function that we saw in the parent. But now we're overriding it so that you'll see that all we're doing inside of it is simply getting the inherited mesh's static mesh and passing it back as the result. Super simple, nothing fancy. We only have one helmet type, so this works for our example. In BP Weapon, however, we've got two different meshes that we can equip. One of them is a hatchet and the other one is a knife. I'm using the variation variable that's inherited from the parent class to determine which mesh to return in this get mesh function that we're overriding here in the child. Again, if you don't see the inherited variables, you can click the little eye over here and then click show inherited variables and you'll see the five variables that we set up in the parent. In the event graph, we're using the same variation variable to set a different offset for the location and rotation based on which mesh we're going to be spawning. Then we're going to call the parent begin play event and print a string after. You would probably have these stored in a data table or something, but I'm doing some hard coding in this example just to keep things simple. Now this may seem like a lot, but I just wanted to show you what it looks like to override both a function and an event. Don't worry, we're going to be visually debugging through all of this in a second. I promise it's going to make perfect sense. So let's take a look at our last class where all of this gets initiated from, and that is our player class. Our player has four variables that we've created, an equipment variable, which is simply an array of actor references, an inventory array that is an array of our inventory item structure that we looked at earlier and I've added three items to this inventory array and I've set some default values in as well. First slot is going to be our BP helmet class. Notice how our drop down only shows us the classes related to BP parent because that's what we set our struct class type to be and variation zero since we only have one helmet and the socket is head. The second and third are both BP weapon classes. One is variation zero and the other one's variation one and the sockets are right hand and left hand respectively. Lastly we've got two booleans just for fun. I've got these set to be replicated so that we can use them in our animation graph so other clients can see the animation as well. So our player is simply going to press one, two, or three, and it's going to call SR spawn and equip server RPC, passing it an integer. The RPC then calls this handle spawn and equip function that stores that item in a local variable called L item since it really doesn't need to be global. And then we're going to check if our equipment array at this item slot already has an actor reference. If it does, we're just going to destroy it like we're unequipping. If not, we're going to spawn the actor at the transform location of our current pawn, passing it the selected inventory item data. Remember how I mentioned earlier that our class type and our struct needs to be specific? Watch what happens when we use a generic actor class. I'll change the class type to a generic actor class in our struct save and then if we go and reconnect you'll notice that a generic actor class doesn't have those exposed variables that we created in our parent class. That's why it's important to have one parent class that accepts all the variables that your child classes may need so you can pass that data in if you need it on spawn. With that being said, don't take what I just said and expose 500 variables on spawn, okay? Don't do that. What I mean is, say for example, you have this item that's gonna be spawned when somebody interacts with it. What you wanna do is you wanna pass an ID into it and then have that class itself go look up all the extra data Data it needs using that ID. That would be a way of having minimal data on the item until it is required and then it would go fetch that information from a data table or something. Just another tip with this spawn actor from class, if you're using a select node to spawn something and you can't get it to return the proper class type, like if I have BP parent here and I drag off and I do a select, it automatically gets changed to a generic class reference. You can simply disconnect this, right click and change pin type and select the proper type. So if I select BP underscore parent, the select node is smart enough to know, okay, you can only pick from these three different types of classes since they all inherit from the same parent class. And then if we connect it, we get those same exposed variables again. Sweet. Once we spawn it, we set the equipment index at that item to this newly spawned actor. Then we switch on that same item. And if it's a helmet, we don't do anything. But if it's a left hand or a right hand, we're flipping the booleans. In the animation blueprint, we're using these boolean values to solve the hand positions in this extremely low budget anim graph. Please don't use this seriously since I just threw this together in a few seconds. But what you can do is, if you haven't done so already, is get into your animation graph and remove the cast that's happening during every frame. You can use this blueprint initialize animation event to do the pawn cast once instead of doing it every single frame. I have no idea why it's set up like this by default, but yeah, anyway, tip number four. So let's go back to our player and drop a breakpoint on the RPC and walk through both child scenarios to see how they behave. All right, so if we hit play and we press one to equip the helmet first, 
And here we go. So the value for the item is zero, which is correct because we pressed one. So let's step through the function and we're storing it locally. We're checking to see that if it's valid, we know it's not going to be valid. So we're just going to step over this guy and you'll see that we're about to spawn an actor. So let's actually step into this one because we want to see what happens when our actor spawns. You'll notice that we hit the event begin play of the parent actor. Even though inventory item zero had the class set to BP helmet, since our helmet didn't have its own begin play event, it fell back to the parent's event begin play. You'll notice a different behavior with the weapon in a sec, but for now, let's just keep going. So this parent is going to set the static mesh. So let's step into that. And what do you know? If we keep stepping through and go back to the parent, you'll notice that we're getting the child's version of that get mesh function, which gives us our VR helmet. You'll notice that even though the parent's location offset is set to zeros by hovering over the variable you'll see that the child's values are what this variable is being populated with let's keep stepping through and then let our server attach the mesh to the proper socket the socket being the head and once that's done we're back in the handle spawn and equip function on the player and now we just set the equipment to this newly spawned item and then we flip the booleans looking real fresh there whitey nice all right, now if we hit three and step to the spawn piece and step into that you'll see that instead of going to the parent we actually went to the child class instead so the helmet example, we went right to the parent since there was no event begin play in the child, so the parent was the fallback. When it comes to inheritance, the most specific version of the function or event will run first. Since BP weapon is more specific than BP parent, we run this event begin play instead. So based on this variation, which has a value of one, our third item in our inventory had that value, we're gonna set the offsets and then we're also calling the parents begin play afterwards. What we're saying here is that we're still going to run the parent event begin play, but we wanna do even more stuff before and after. Sometimes it's just after, sometimes it's just before, but either way, you can extend the functionality by doing it this way. This works for both functions and events, and I'll show you how to do it in a little bit. So if we keep stepping through, we hop up to the parents version of the event begin play, and it's gonna run through the same exact logic we did last time. First thing it's gonna do is it's gonna set the static mesh, which then takes us back to the child's version since the child is overriding this function. Looks like we're going to get the knife mesh returned, so step through back up to the parent and hover over the value, and yup. That's a knife. Then we continue and do the same thing, but this time the socket is the left hand, and if we step again, we're actually back in the child class, because remember, we've got one more thing to do after the parent's event begin play is done, and that's simply to print the string of this child class. Where's your NG? Why are you looking for your NG? He flipped my pepper. Alrighty then. Hopefully that was pretty straightforward and easy to follow. If you have any questions, let me know, but let's see how we can override functions in a child class, as well as call functions on a parent class from the child. So to override a function, you create a function in the parent class and in the child class, if you hover over the function section, you'll see override. Click that and you should see the parent function you just created. By default, when you override it, it already has a call to the parent function. This was similar to what our event had earlier. You can run both versions of this function and do more logic in here before returning, or you can simply just delete the call to the parent function and override it with whatever you want your child class to do with it. And to call a parent function, simply right click on the function or event and click add call to parent function. This will give you the exact function, whether it's pure or impure or if it's an event, and you can connect and call it wherever you'd like within the child class. So you can do some logic here, call the parent function and whatever is in the parent function will do its thing. And then you can continue to do stuff in the child function again or keep going. Don't worry if none of this inheritance stuff makes sense yet. I'm going to have an in-depth video that's going to make things clear as mud. For now, I just want to show you one last trick that I mentioned earlier. We can get a little bit of help by adding a temporary static mesh to the parent and then having that static mesh get attached to wherever the actor is going to be. This static mesh is going to be your visual representation for where the actor actually is at all times. And to make things even easier, if we show the engine content, we can look for axis and we should see a transform gizmo mesh. The pieces that stick out are the positive axis directions based on which way the actor is facing and the opposite is obviously the negative. So let's just say we wanted to rotate this helmet so he's wearing it sideways towards the left. Since we can see the actor, we know which way we need to move it relative to the actor to make that happen. I know that this is the z-axis right here, so if I rotate it counterclockwise by 40 degrees, it should give me the position that I want. A super easy way to do this is to keep Pi running and open up the viewport for the helmet and adjust it as you please. So let's do negative 40 degrees on the Z and notice how I'm only moving the one component. This gizmo is helpful because it lets me know where my actor is and which way it's facing at all times. But this is a bit too easy because you can see that the actor hasn't really rotated out of its original position. It lines up with the head really nice. But if we take out the knife, you can see that the actor is completely out of whack when it comes to rotation. Now pretend we're making Assassin's Creed and we want to move this knife up to his elbow. Now we wouldn't 
wouldn't know which direction that is. But since we have this axis gizmo, we know that positive X is facing this way. So we simply just need to move it in the negative X direction and that should give us the result that we want. You'll notice that if I try to adjust the rotation of the knife, nothing happens. And I don't know why that is. I think it's a bug, but for some reason, if you make any initial changes on it, like we're doing in the parent class where we're actually setting the relative rotation, it won't let you edit it live in Pi. I haven't figured out why yet. If you know, please let me know in the comments. I am thinking it's a bug, but I could be wrong. But we can quickly fix this by skipping this step in the parent for now. We'll hit play and then we'll equip. And then we can get the exact transform we need by rotating and moving this component around until we like what we see. Once we got our values, we can reset the transform and then reconnect the parent's event begin play to the set relative node. And now if we hit play again, voila, looking straight up G whitey. Shout out to my first three patrons, Alexander, Pale Spider, and Rainbow Shaggy. Thank you guys so much for your support. I am truly humbled by your generosity and not only by your donations, but by the kind words of encouragement that you guys followed up with. I was supposed to say thank you, but you guys showed up and gave me even more encouragement after you did that. So thank you so much. You guys will forever be remembered in my soul and I hope your games blow up and become number one hits and everyone else's games can go up and do well too. What'd you guys think I was gonna say? I want everybody to succeed. I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace!